Hi, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. We're so excited that you're here today. I am joined with by my cohort, Kathy Anderson, and Tony Koski will be our pilot today, and I'm Allison O'Connor. Really glad that you're here, really looking forward to talking to you about perennials in just a couple of minutes. I have just a couple of housekeeping slides before I sh uh, turn it to Cassie. Uh, so we are with CSU Extension, and just a disclaimer that CSU is an equal opportunity access and non-discrimination university. If there's anything we can do to accommodate your needs, please let us know and visit the website. We are thrilled to be here and sharing some of our perennial knowledge with you. As a reminder, as always, these webinars are recorded and you can find them at the CSU Hort Blogspot site. Perhaps Cassie can throw that into the chat for you or I will later. So we are recording this. So if you get cut off or you need to leave or you just have a busy day, we understand you can find us um, in about a week or so on the cohort's blog. And that's also where you can sign up for upcoming webinars. So next month, Darren Davidson, our fellow colleague, will join us, and she's going to talk a little bit about the WaterWise updates for lawns and landscapes, some of the legislation that's come through, some of the programs that CSU Extension has, and you can either scan that QR code or you can go and register for that webinar on March 13th at noon. So without further ado, both Cassie and I are with CSU Extension, joined by our colleague Tony, and we are going to talk everything perennials, a totally biased perspective. And Cassie's going to share her screen now. And of course, get myself unmuted. Yes, welcome everybody. We're so glad you could make it. This talk was inspired. Allison and I were at the perennial or at the annual trial gardens last summer, and we kind of started thinking, you know, what if we put a talk together that was just about our favorite perennial flowers and um, ornamentals? So that's how this happened. Um, and so with that, it takes a lot to garden successfully in Colorado. And the, the plants that we're gonna talk about today are those that are good choices for Colorado. They're going to tolerate our weird conditions. We don't have a lot of humidity. We have alkaline soils that can be tough for some of our favorite plants back from the East Coast. Our temperatures might be 60 degrees one day and minus 20 degrees the next day. We do have a lot of wind. We're high up in elevation. We're um, a mile above sea level. So there's that much smaller column of air above us, making the sun that much more intense. And our growing season is relatively short. So it can be a little bit challenging to make things work. But most of the plants that we're talking about here today are plants that are going to do pretty well. First off, we want to make sure that you are aware that there are a lot of different ways in which members of the green industry are trying to make sure that they that we have good plant choices for our areas. And so there are plant introduction programs that you can check in with, you can um, buy from in some cases or work with in, in others to help you find good plants for your area. So those include Plant Select, uh, the Colorado Native Plant Society, and Sego Supreme from Utah State are some really good programs to be familiar with to make sure that you know what some good plants are for our area. Where can you find perennials? I mean, online is a great place to start if you don't have a nursery right near you, but there are always local nurseries or commercial suppliers um, that you can work with. Uh, a lot of times if you go check with your local nursery, it's a little late in the season now, but if you check with them in the fall and say, hey, I, here's a list of plants I would love to start growing, sometimes they can get orders in. If they get enough requests, it might make it worth their while to add that to their regular roster. You can also check out Plant Select, which is an association between colorists. I think I have a slide for that next, actually. I'm going to. Um, I'll wait on that part. Um, ProGreen, if you are in the green industry, is a great way to learn about new introductions, new plants, and new ways of managing our landscapes. Um, oh, no, I don't have a ProGreen. Okay. 
or Plant Select. So Plant Select is an association between Colorado State University, which is us, um, the green industry across the state of Colorado and Denver Botanic Gardens. And they do research on a regular basis to figure out new plants, new introductions, the Stella Sperma up here. And this is their website, but this is the, they introduced a lot of del, a lot of new Della Sperma as or ice plants as options for um, pretty plants that you can put into your landscape. So let's start off with kind of thinking about what is the, what is a perennial? A perennial is a plant and um, that returns year after year from the same rootstock. It's not reseeding itself. It's not um, you don't need to plant it over and over. Perennials generally are herbaceous, not woody, although some of them have kind of characteristics that become a little bit woody. They will regrow from the crown of the plant where, where the roots meet the soil. And they usually have a set bloom time uh, that you can you can kind of count on within the season. Not all perennials have are selected for their blooms, but they all do have some type of bloom. There are, generally speaking, two types of perennials that we work with. There are short-lived perennials. These grow well for a couple of years, then fade away or reseed into the landscape. That columbine here at the top is a great example of perennial biology. I get that question not infrequently. Somebody will have planted a columbine, and they'll see it pop up elsewhere in their yard, but the original plant three to five years in hasn't come back and they don't know what they did wrong. Uh, it's not that they did anything wrong, it's just a shorter lived perennial. Peonies, on the other hand, with the bottom picture, um, those can live 80 to 100 years quite easily and become kind of a heritage plant. So there's different, different levels of perennials. Some of the common short lived perennials you might see, Columbine, I already mentioned, Delphinium, Blanket Flower, uh, plant, Perennial Flax, Lupine, are all going to have shorter lifespans. So they might live three to seven years, somewhere in that. And then they will need to be replanted or reseeded, encourage them to reseed for sure. Longer lived perennials, I mentioned that peony. Daylilies are also very long lived as are iris, if you manage them appropriately. False indigo or bapticia, um, very long lived and yarrow. So some good examples of longer lived perennials. Okay, I think Yes. yes, it's me. Okay, <laughs> we're going to be switching on and off, back and forth throughout this whole talk, and sometimes we forget which, where, where our points are. <laughs> so when you're selecting and planting perennials, you'll want to choose plants that are robust, but if at all possible, not flowering. Flowering takes a lot of energy for the plant, and so if you can either cut off the flowers, it sounds terrible, but remove those flowers so that when you're planting, the resources go into root development, that is going to be better. Um, you could root wash these plants if you want to, just take like a little bucket or a water and just kind of root wash and then mess up the root system. Um, because these are herbaceous, the root system is easy to kind of manipulate and tear apart, but you do want to make sure that these plants are not root um, soak them before planting and then water daily for at least the first week. And then it will depend on your site conditions, depend on if you're on drip irrigation, depend if we have natural precipitation. It will depend on a lot of things at how much you need to water going forward. But for the most part, you're going to want to water regularly and they need at least one season before they get established. So do water them regularly after that first week, maybe two or three times a week. But Check your finger, use your finger, and then check the moisture in the bottom of the planting hole and around the root. Thanks, Cassie. So should you plant container or bare root? Now in the spring is when you're going to see our bare root plants. You might see these at garden centers, you might see them at box stores, and they're not incredibly common. If you're doing some online purchasing or mail order, you might get things bare root because they're a lot less expensive to ship versus a pot and media and everything else. Um, but for the most part, you're going to see these very early in the spring. Now, if you're in May or June and you're still seeing bare root perennials, try to walk on by. It's probably not worth planting them. They're going to be stressed out. So it is better to do those early in the spring. And you can plant those as soon as you can work the soil. So sometime March, April, it really depends on the type of spring that we have. 
Now, container-grown perennials are the most common to all of us. These are the ones in the black plastic containers or in the square pots, and they are really common. They're less expensive if they're smaller in size. Uh, but again, as you lift them out of the container, if you see any of those roots circling on the outside periphery, take a tool, take your hands, but really kind of tear them apart. You are not going to hurt the plant, I promise. Uh, for our wizened gardeners, you know that this is somewhat of a stress reliever, uh, but that is a good thing because all those points where the roots tear apart are going to form new roots. The time of year for planting will really depend on when you're growing and what your growing condition is like. Now, I saw we had some friends join us from uh, New Mexico. So you're going to have an earlier growing season than if you're in the mountain areas of Colorado. For the most part, though, perennials can be planted any time during the growing season, spring to fall. There are a few that prefer spring planting so that they have an entire season to establish before we go into a winter. We'll mention those as we come across them during our totally biased perennial selection when we talk to you about the flowers themselves. Uh, but for the most part, you want to give them as long of an establishment period as possible. Now, here in the Front Range last fall, we had an incredible incredibly long fall. It was great. We had warm temperatures well until October, and so we could plant until that point. But again, usually you're looking at the end of March, April as the beginning of the planting season, and then trying to wrap things up by September, depending on your locations, is the best. The biggest thing is to make sure that these plants are watered and especially hydrated going into the winter months. For maintenance, we talked briefly about watering, but really it's that first season of, of establishment that you need to focus on. So even if your plants are native, even if they're water-wise, even if they're xeric, you know, they really need regular water to become established. No plant is going to survive by planting and watering once and then hoping that, you know, the elements will take care of it. No plant is going to do that. So again, all newly planted plants, whether they're perennials, whether they're trees and shrubs, are going to need regular water through that establishment period. Watering is going to depend on your site, your soil, your climate, the type of you know, gardener you are, but really for that first week, probably daily, and then every few days as the soil dries down. Use your finger again to monitor those uh, soil moisture levels and then check your drip irrigation. I think sometimes we put false hope into our irrigation systems that they're giving out the right amounts. I have seen perennials drown from too much water. I've also seen perennials perish because the drip isn't working or the line is clogged or something happens. And so don't just rely on the drip irrigation, but definitely start checking it. And then as things get established, as those plants become larger, you can then adjust the water as needed. So newly planted plants will need more water than established perennials. And if you're growing water-wise plants or native plants, they're going to need very little, if any, water once they're established. With weed barrier, this is just something we can't get behind. So weed barrier in a landscape setting for the most part is not something we recommend. Uh, the pores in the weed barrier clog, the mulch slides off, weeds still grow on the top of the weed barrier, and it doesn't do a lot to actually prevent weed growth. For those of you who've worked with weed barrier or maybe removed it from your landscape, you might have peeled it up and you saw all those beautiful creamy white roots right at the soil surface. And what that is is because those roots need oxygen, which is going to be highest at higher soil levels, and they need water. And so if you don't have you have something that's impeding water and oxygen from getting down into the soil, the roots are going to try to do what they can to obtain water and moisture. So don't use it. Find a mulch instead that works for you. Uh, we're not going to really discuss types of mulch. It could be a wood mulch. It could be a, um, a squeegee type or a rock mulch, depending on what you're growing. Uh, but really, weed barrier is not going to prevent weeds, and you're just going to get frustrated. So plant your plants in the soil, apply your mulch directly to the soil surface, and then water accordingly. Uh, going forward, and you'll still have weeds, right? Weeds are a part of gardeners' lives, and it's just something uh, that we have to accept. So nothing is perfect, uh, but weed barrier really doesn't do a lot. 
for maintenance, for the most part, we can either divide these perennials or we can leave them in place. Uh, perennials are nice because as they get larger or as they kind of outgrow their space, we can essentially hack them into bits and then have new perennials that we can then benefit from. So if you're looking to move or divide plants, it's really going to depend on the type or the time of year that they bloom. For our spring blooming perennials, this would be our dianthus, this would be some of our other spring blooming perennials, um, you're going to want to let them bloom first. And then after they finish blooming, that is when you can dig them up and divide them. And divide them is just what it sounds like. You're going to dig up the entire clump of plant and then taking a knife or a shovel or something sharp and just dividing it into sections. You can replant one section where the original plant was and then either plant the others in your landscape or share with for summer blooming perennials, this would be some of our sedums, our coneflowers, our bee balm. You're going to want to divide those in spring. So as soon as you see early spring growth, dig up the clump, divide it into sections, and then replant it. Whenever you divide and replant, you are going to treat that as a brand new perennial. So back to the uh, daily watering for a while, you're going to then be water it on a regular basis um, and do those things. With ornamental grasses in particular, sometimes you get that dead spot in the center. It might be worth just buying a new ornamental grass, uh, but you could dig it up, remove that dead portion, and then divide out the rest of the areas surrounding that dead center um, and divide those into areas. I haven't had great success with ornamental grass um, division, but I'm also not the best gardener. So um, it may not be me, or it may be me and not you. Uh, but just know that division can happen, and it is a regular maintenance practice that you can do. With winter care, you really have two options. The first is that you could just leave everything standing in your landscape. So at the end of the summer, going into fall, if you're just tired, if you don't wanna do any more gardening, we get it. Um, you can just leave things standing. There is a thought that if you leave plants in their foliage, they do tend to collect any snow or moisture that falls. So in some cases, the crown of the plant is really kind of protected and can absorb and obtain some of that snow better. Otherwise, you can cut every back. I would leave some things with winter interest standing. So in this case, we have the echinacea or the coneflower. Ornamental grasses could be standing. Some of the taller sedums are great. So anything that might have winter interest or provide food for the birds or just might look interesting to you during these bleak winter months could be something that you leave. But it's really up to you, um, the time of year, when you're able to do it, and how much energy you have. All right, back to Cassie. Okay, let's dive right into some of our, our plants. So these, like like we said, it's totally biased. These are favorites of either Allison's or mine. There are some that are my favorites and Allison doesn't care for, and there are some that are Allison's favorites and I don't care for. Um, but we wanted to include both, all of them. Uh, most of these have been proven to do well in most situations, at least along the color in Colorado and along the Front Range. Uh, they are ornamental, sometimes in numerous different ways, and typically they are they behave pretty nicely. They're not going to invade your space or take over part of your landscape. All right, but first off, let's look at at some definitions. Um, an ornamental is actually one that Alice and I had to look up. We haven't we had the idea of what ornamental was, but actually coming up with a full on definition, we had to had to look it up. So ornamentals are plants that are grown in horticultural production by the commercial nursery and greenhouse industry. They may be introduced from other parts of the world. So throughout this talk, we will have done our best to try and show tell you whether or not an, a plant we're talking about is ornamental introduced, if it is native or if it is a native R. Um, so a native is a plant that is indigenous to an area either a region, an ecosystem, or a habitat. So there can be native plants that are native to the Intermountain West or to one particular part of a mountain system in Colorado. There's different levels at which something can be native. A native R is a native plant that has been bred for a particular trait, and it is typically less genetically diverse and often will not breed true to type. This is really common with columbines. It's very common with echinacea. We definitely see it in quite a few different situations. These native Rs 
which are good to have. They're not sometimes as if your goal is natives, they might not be quite as good for your landscape as a, a true native, but they're still pretty awesome. Okay, we wanted to start off very first with um, a discussion of bulbs. Bulbs really are one of the unsung heroes of springtime. Uh, I am always surprised when I drive around in the spring how few homes have bulbs because they are incredibly low maintenance. You plant them and a lot of them will, re will spread and fill a space. Uh, they will continue year over year, especially if you give them very minimal care. You give them a little shot of nitrogen as the, as the flowers are fading um, and leave those leaves up then you'll get some great bulbs. So these are things like tulips, hyacinth, daffodil, crocus, squill. I forgot to add allium to this list. I don't know how because I have like 500 allium at my house. But allium are another excellent one that can extend from very early season all the way into the middle of the summer. Some less common bulbs that we think you should definitely look into and plant. Um, species tulips, these guys right here. These are a little bit more ornamental. I think I have a slide specifically on them. Grape hyacinth. Some places I know have lots of grape hyacinth, but for newer developments, newer areas, grape hyacinth or mascari um, can be a really nice one to incorporate into your lawn if you want to have a little bit, if you want to wait a week or two to mow your first mowing, they'll be done by then. Snowdrops are another one, these guys. They will literally come up while there is still snow melting in the in your landscape. Um, some great choices. Yes, here's that species tulip. Um, these are sometimes called wildflower tulips. They're usually shorter, smaller. They have a larger leaf, and it's a very they're, they're very pretty leaves. And the nice thing about species tulips is they have a tendency to naturalize. What naturalizing means is that they will create secondary bulblets that will then make new flowers and new bulbs in future years. Um, they are perfect for rock gardens. Uh, they're perfect for your xeric garden. They have finished their life cycle by the time things get hot and dry. So it's a really nice way to kind of manage things. And hopefully with any of these bulbs, we will be starting, CSU is going to be starting some bulb research soon. I'm hoping to help out with some of that. Dr. Chad Miller, bulbs are one of his favorite things to do so or to, to research so hopefully we can have some even better and more specific information on bulbs that are well suited for our area in the coming years but even at this point there's so many good bulbs that you can pick and choose and put into your landscape okay Okay, questions are coming in heavy. So let's talk about a few sun-loving perennials, if we can. Next slide, Cassie. The first, and actually, Cassie, I think this is yours, but I'm going to do it if that's okay, and then I'll toss it back to you. Totally um, fine. Yes. Peonies. So uh, Cassie got to talk peonies when we gave this presentation. So now I get to wax poetic about peonies because I love them as much as she does. So these are one of our heritage flowers, the ones that you plant and you have for decades. The ones when you move from a house, you actually dig them up because you still want to have them. They are long lived, they are tough, and they are beautiful. They're also an amazing cut flower and have a really nice floral fragrance. Um, they get to be about three by three at maturity. And the thing with peonies is really once you plant them, leave them be. Don't touch them, don't dig them up, even though I just said you might want to, but for the most part, once they find their home, they are going to be perfectly happy in their home going forward. They're not great for pollinators because the flowers are too dense and generally pollinators can't get into where um, the pollen is available. A couple of species, which is the next slide, Um, Sarah Bernhardt, she's a beautiful pale pink. Um, and then Carl Rosenfeld, he's more of a, a dark pink magenta. These are two classic peonies. There's many, many other types. There's whites, there's um, darker pinks, there's, um, they're just wonderful flowers. And then when you harvest, harvest them at the marshmallow stage. So if you can think of like one of those marshmallows you would use for s'mores, kind of squishy, that's the stage that you would harvest so that you have a maximum cut flower length for these flowers. They're absolutely wonderful. Everyone should have a peony in my opinion. 
All right, I'll toss it back to Cassie. Thank you. Yes, this was one of mine. So I'm always a sucker for the perennial plant that gives you just that, that very different texture, that very different interest in your landscape. And this Silver Heels Whorehound is definitely one of them. It is a ground cover, so it's only maybe six to 10 inches tall, but it can get up to four feet wide into a big mat shape. So it's a good ground cover. Not going to be one that you want to walk on a lot, but it is just, it is a very beautiful plant. It is resistant to both deer and rabbit. That conversation I've already seen popping up in the Q&A. Um, so if that's an issue for you, then you can, then it, this could be an option for you. It does have flowers, um, but they're not a very distinct flower. They're just, they're just a little stalk that co goes up, not much higher than the leaves themselves. And they're white. They're not very, they're kind of nondescript. Uh, there are some pollinators that come to them, but it's not a whole bunch of them. So it's definitely one that's a nice, a nice thing to include to add different texture to your, to your landscape. Uh, someone just asked if it self-seeds. I have not seen much instance of it self-seeding in our, in our demonstration garden. And it's not one that I've, I've gotten yet for my personal garden, but I love it in our demo garden. Okay. Al, do you want to take sedums? Always love the sedums. <laughs> so the, the sedums and the sempervirums, or sometimes we just call them the semps, uh, these are our kind of cacti-like plants. They are succulents, they have different diversity, they have different textures, and they are overall absolutely amazing. And so uh, let's talk a little bit more about some of the sedums that you can consider. The first is Angelina. So Angelina has been around for a while and I bet many of you have Angelina in your garden and I hope you're loving her as much as I do. In the summer, she is bright lime green. Chartreuse lime green really brightens up a space. And I will say, remember, we're talking about full sun plants. So these need a sunny location and the sedums and the semps in particular love it hot and dry. In the, winter, in the fall, as the days get cooler and as the nights get a little chilly, Angelina will kind of turn this russet orange color and she is phenomenal. So if you're missing some of those orange or those red fall colors, you should look to some of our perennials because they can do this for you. We'll mention a couple others going forward as well. So that's Angelina. Another one that was introduced by uh, Plant Select is Turquoise Tails. So this was introduced about 10 or 11 years ago. And this is another sedum, a ground cover sedum. And for a lot of these ground cover sedums, I find the flowers to be kind of distracting. I don't love them. So you can remove them or you can leave them. But really the compactness of the foliage on turquoise tails is very interesting. Um, this is one that grows so well. So if you have a rock garden or just a space where you need to fill in, this is one that gently grows and you might find it planting itself in other parts of your landscape. I would never say it's invasive and it's not at all out of control, uh, but it is fun to see it planted elsewhere. A taller sedum that you might consider is Autumn Fire. There's another cousin called Autumn Joy, and that's very common. Um, there are some variegated types, but these are much larger sedums. So the first two are ground covers, and this is more knee height. And it blooms late into the fall, so late August, September. And that's when the garden is getting a little bit tired. We're getting tired. Uh, and we need just some something. And so it's a great late season pollinator plant. And the heads on this will stay intact throughout the winter months. So they'll actually capture snow and it provides a lot of winter interest. So I love the taller sedums. I love the shorter sedums. Um, and then the last slide I have is on the uh, the sempervirums or the hens and chicks as they're commonly called. There is a line of hens and chicks called chick charms. I have seen them at all many garden centers. I haven't seen them at the box stores, but at the independent garden centers, you can find these and they have the best names and such diversity uh, within their foliage themselves. So you can see we have some with red tips, we have some with blackish tips, um, mint marble, apple teeny. They have the most fun names. And so I have started a collection of these chick charms because I can't get enough of them. Um, again, more of a hot, dry, 
site, perfect for rock gardens. They're a ground cover. They do not take foot traffic, so make sure that you keep them away um, if you have an area that gets a lot of foot traffic. Back to Cassie. All right. Uh, one note someone asked in the chat, and I just wanted to say it as well, that there are definitely sedums that are not hardy in Colorado. So do check your hardiness zone when you're buying them to make sure that they're going to overwinter for you. All right. On to prairie spiderwort. This is our first native. Um, it is there. There are varieties of Tridescantia that are not native that are that have different ornamental qualities. But the Tridescantia occidentalis is definitely a native variety that does very well in drought, but it can also go in a meadow or in a rain garden if you have one. It will self-seed a little bit over time, but it is not hard to manage in, in if you if it becomes a little if it goes somewhere that you don't want it. It's a taller plant; it gets about two feet tall, and it has just these beautiful little blue flowers that are nicely attractive to bees and butterflies. And it has a huge cluster of them, so they'll it'll bloom a few of them at a time. Those will fade; new ones will come up. So it has a long season of bloom, long season of interest. Uh, a really nice one that I don't see in a lot of landscapes, and so it would be nice to see more of it. But it's certainly one that you see in the the foothills a lot outside of Boulder. I see it in the foothills when I go on hikes, and I always love to see it. I've tried seeding it from those in my yard, but I haven't had success just yet. I do have one of uh, a more ornamental variety in my landscape. Penstemon. Pens there are so many varieties of penstemon. Um, we're going to touch on just a couple of them, but penstemon are a heavy hitter for our landscapes in, in the West, like in their Intermountain West region. They can vary in size, in shape, in color. This one here is the penstemon pinifolius, the pine tip penstemon or pine leaf. Um, and it has a red bloom, but they can be white, they can be purple, they can be blue. They are very attractive to uh, hummingbirds, very attractive to bees. I see a lot, like some of the larger moths on them as well. They do tend to like soils that have a lower fertility. Um, so this isn't one that you need to put into your landscape that you've heavily amended with organic material. Um, there are quite a few varieties that might not be hardy here. So check your tags. Um, and make sure that you're buying from, from local retailers who are more likely to be buying for Colorado. But let's take a look at a couple specifics. Uh, Carolyn's Hope Penstemon gets 14 to 18 inches tall. It is a plant select selection. It is one that I have seen in nurseries fairly commonly, so this is one you're going to be able to find, which is great. It's a little bit more of a sparse. It almost, it sometimes gives me a little bit of a feel of a a lupine or something like that, but with that, that bellflower penstemon shape and just that lovely pink color. Coral baby. Um, this is one we just had our demonstration garden meeting at my office. And this is one of those shorter lived varieties. A lot of penstemons are a shorter lived variety. And we've planted it twice in our demo garden in it's almost 10 years. And we it did not come back last year. So we decided we're going to replant it because it's just so incredible. It gets 16 to 20 inches tall and it gets really nice and wide. So, such an abundance of incredibly beautiful flowers. Also a plant select selection. Okay. Okay, lavender. One that Cassie uh, did not care to talk about. So I will talk about it because I adore lavender and I think Colorado is such a good climate for this plant. Even though it grows on those rocky Mediterranean kind of cliffs, uh, Colorado is perfect for it because we have more alkaline soils. And so it's one of the better herbs that can do really well here, especially in a hot, dry location. Uh, so this is one that I will tell you, if you plan to add lavender to your garden, to do it in the spring as opposed to the fall. Fall planted lavender tends to winter kill more often, and I'm not sure if it's because it needs longer to establish or the crown is sensitive to cold temperatures, but spring planted lavender is going to have much better success at overwintering. So let's look a little bit more at lavender. There is a platinum blonde lavender um, and it's variegated. 
you can make your choice. Uh, I don't know exactly how I feel about it. I think it's to me just a little jarring. Um, it is cool though, because it has this variegated leaf with kind of a dark green and a lighter yellow color. Um, so it is there, it is hardy to zone six. And so I have tried to grow this. I did not provide enough winter protection. I also think it was a fall plant of lavender. So again, many strikes against me for why this did not work in my garden. Uh, but for the most part, if you can find a spot for it, it might provide the perfect thing. Uh, there is also a um, dwarf lavender called We One, which is the next slide on that was introduced by the Plant Select Program. And this is a hybrid of an English type. So when we're looking at lavender, we want to make sure that we're planting hardy types. The English types are going to be the most hardy and we one is a descendant of an English type of lavender. So basically for the larger lavenders, if the name sounds English, it's probably English. So Munstead, Hidcoat, Mitchum Gray, those are all types of English lavender that are going to be hardy. Sometimes in the spring, you might see the Spanish or French lavenders available, especially at box stores. They have a different flower shape. and Those are not going to be hardy for Colorado. So do select your lavender accordingly and become familiar with the cultivars. Now, Wee One is so cute. It's only about 12 inches tall. It is perfect for rock gardens. They have some beautiful patches of it growing at the Treasure Island Demonstration Garden in Windsor. They have this amazing rock garden and it just fills in these little pockets. It's wonderful. And again, it's a little bit smaller and this is a hardy one to Colorado. So if you wanna grow lavender, plant it in the spring and then just make sure that you're buying hardy types. Hot flower oregano is the next one on our list. This is technically a ground cover because it only gets to be about 14 to 16 inches tall. The reason I love this and Cassie loves this too is that the flowers are so interesting. It's actually a pollinator plant. Um, for those of you who've grown hops to brew your own beer, you'll notice that the flower itself is reminiscent of a hop. So it's called hot flower oregano. Now, while we say it's an oregano, this is not an edible type. So just like a lot of the sages, we have edible types and non-edible types. This is not edible, so please don't go munching on it. Uh, that said, deer and rabbits seem to avoid it, so it's a nice one. It's really cool because it kind of sprawls and grows, and then it has these really beautiful flowers with these um, little tiny purple flowers and then these really cool flower bracts. Uh, it looks great if you can place it over a retaining wall or maybe have it positioned. But what's also nice is that those flowers kind of dry down, those, those flower bracts dry down, and then they hold their shape and form in the winter months. So it's really nice for winter interest as well. Next slide. Back to Cassie. All right, I am also always a sucker for the plants that give a pop of color. Diversity in the garden is is the thing that makes me get excited. Um, so butterfly weed or Asclepias tuberosa is just an incredible one to include in your landscape. It has such bright and cheerful flowers, that incredibly vivid orange. Once they're established, they're very low water needs. They're fairly easy to grow. So it's a nice one if you're a lazy gardener like I am. They do grow pretty big. They can get up to three feet tall if they really like their situation. So they can fill a space nicely if you want a space that for like a small shrub, but you don't want the commitment of a small shrub. Butterfly weed can kind of give you that. They do tend to be rabbit and deer resistant and they are a native if native is a goal for you. They are very good for pollinators. Uh, they are a food because they are a um, milkweed. They are a good source for monarch caterpillars if that's something you're trying to do. I know we're not a monarch migration pathway in Colorado, but sometimes we get those stragglers and it's nice to be able to provide something for them. And this is a little less invasive than that, than the showy milkweed that you see in a lot of open spaces and sometimes fight if you get them in to an area of your yard that they decide they, they want to set up home in. So this, if you want to try and attract some monarchs, then the butterfly weed can be a really nice option for that. Next one is pasque flower. These guys are I haven't seen any yet, but these guys are usually one of our first bloomers along the front range in the open spaces. They are a native. Uh, there are native R varieties. There are reds and whites and pinks, um, but this this purple color is your, your typical bloom. 
that you see in the native variety. And they, like I said, they bloom very, very early, as early as late February, fairly often, and produce then this little tufted seed head kind of, that kind of makes me think of a truffula tree from the Lorax. If you are trying to grow past flower, it's typically best if you can try and grow them from seed or transplant them with a really young, um, really young plant because they do have a very deep tap root that can be difficult to transplant once they're old and established. Um, and they are a nice, so, I mean, look at how much pollen. I have a picture that I haven't been able to find of a bee just like half body deep inside one of these flowers just covered in pollen. They are a very good source of food for our pollinators early in the season. So one that we should definitely have more of go go forth and get the natives and the native ours because they are all lovely and wonderful. Uh, Zauchneria or epilobium, it's had a name change, but a lot of us uh, horticulturists are a little stubborn and we keep calling it Zauchneria. Uh, hummingbird trumpet as well is a wonderful ground cover if you want some reds in your garden or oranges, depending on your perspective. I think they tend to be a little more red, um, but most people call it orange. Um, they not, they're not very tall, nice little ground cover, about six inches tall. The only weed I've ever seen make their way through Zauchneria is the, is bindweed, which honestly makes it through pretty much everything. Um, so they're, but besides that, they're very good at, at out competing weeds and not very tempting to deer or to rabbits. Very attractive to hummingbirds, to hummingbird moths, sphinx moths. Uh, butterflies, I see a lot of those guys. They do need to be uh, pollinators that have that long proboscis or beak so they can get up into those flowers because they are fairly long, just an, an inch, like an inch, inch and a half long. So they're a little bit harder to get into for a bee, for example, unless it's a very tiny native bee or something. Then we've got our blazing star or Liatris. There are many, many different varieties of these. Some of them are very small, compact, and polite. Um, some of them are large. I got one last year I put in my yard and it grew about, it, it was at least six feet tall before it flopped over. Uh, part of that is probably the fact that it rained nonstop from April until mid-July last year, but it'll be interesting to see how tall they grow this year with a little with potentially a little less rain. Liatris is nice because it tolerates both moist and moderate soils. So if it's if you have an area that you have that gets a little bit more moisture, this could be a good place. If you see them up in the wilds, uh, up in the mountains, they tend to be in wet meadows. But there are so many different varieties. There are both um, native varieties and native ours. Um, they're both pretty going to likely be fairly good for pollinators because they have these blooms. And the nice thing about these, they, they bloom in sequence over time. So these are the open flowers and these ones down here further on the stem are going to open later. So they have a longer season of, of bloom for sure that is going to give you nice interest for a long period of time. And chocolate flower. Um, I, off, I say a lot of plants are my favorite, but if I had to pick one, then chocolate flower or Berlandia, um, could, Berlandaria could very well be one of my absolute favorite plants, which is funny because it's fairly nondescript in its appearance. It's just a little, it's a little yellow daisy looking flower, but in, especially in the morning hours, if you walk by, they smell so strongly of chocolate and it is an incredible smell. If, if fragrance is important to you in your landscape, they can be very good. These are um, native to the Intermountain West as well. Um, and they, they they grow fairly large. They can get about a foot to a foot and a half tall. They do reseed pretty well if it's an area that they're getting good care and they've got a good place to reseed into. They do tend to be a little difficult to transplant. In my yard, I have planted about nine of them and I still have about five alive. So kind of put that into perspective when you're thinking about how to get them or try growing them yourself, transplant them out as young seedlings. In July, mid-July or so, usually you can cut them back to keep them from getting too sprawly. They don't have the best habit as they're growing. They can tend to look a little bit messy and cutting them back will also encourage a much longer bloom. And who doesn't want to have a longer bloom smelling like having your yard smelling chocolate? 
So to wrap up our sun section, two ornamental grasses that are probably common to you. The first is Blonde Ambition Blue Grandma. This is a native R. So of course we have a Blue Grandma that is native to the Eastern Plains of Colorado. It's becoming a little bit of a popular lawn grass as well. Uh, so this is an ornamental introduction and it was selected because the seed head is a little more chartreuse, a little more blonde. Um, and these are the, the mustache grass plants or the eyelash grass plants, however you want to call it. Um, it is becoming exceedingly popular in landscape designs. And I've seen it at Costco and Target and all of a lot of commercial landscaping places. I wouldn't say that we're sick of it yet. And it's not at the level of Carl Forrester. I still love Carl, don't worry. Um, but it is incredibly popular and it grows really well. Um, it is deer resistant. The thing is, is that it can reseed in your landscape. So all of those seeds are viable. Sometimes when we have native ours, our selection, the seeds themselves are sterile. And so you won't get new plants, but in this case you do but the seeds will not be true to type. So you won't have blonde ambition seeds. You'll have a blue grandma, um, but it's not necessarily blonde ambition. Now, have I noticed it a lot in my landscape? Only in a couple spots, and I don't find it bothersome at all. It's just something to be aware of. The next plant is Standing Ovation Little Blue Stem. Little Blue Stem is also a native to Colorado, and Standing Ovation is a selection. There was a lot of breeding that went into selecting some ornamental grasses, especially at the University of Minnesota. And standing ovation was selected because it doesn't lodge. And lodge means tip over or fall over. We sometimes see this with our ornamental grasses in the winter. If we get a heavy wet snow or a really big windstorm or something, those grasses can actually flop over and then they just look mushed and not very attractive. So it was called standing ovation because it kept its form even in the winter months, which says something uh, for Minnesota winters, but it also has incredible fall color. So we talked about Angelina the sedum having really beautiful kind of orangey fall color. This is one that actually turns red. So as our season shortens, as days get cooler, it's going to get flecks of red along the grass blades. And so you kind of have this, you know, grayish green blue colors transitioning into more of the purple red. Uh, the total height of the grass is about 36 inches tall. Um, its cousin is big blue stem. It's a different species, um, but it is a very doable, smaller ornamental grass for the landscape. Um, I love it. There's other little blue stems that you could also consider, but this one we had to mention because of the fall color. Moving now into our shade plants, uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is Bleeding Heart. This is an old fashioned perennial. This is one that I remember as a kid, my grandma grew Bleeding Heart growing up in Minnesota, um, and I just love it. The best part about Bleeding Heart is that it loves the shade and it doesn't like hot temperatures. And so it will bloom very early in the spring, usually May or June, you'll see blooms. And then when it gets too hot and too dry, the plant just fades away. It kind of turns brown, it goes dormant, and then reappears the next year. We have pink forms, we have white forms, and the flowers are so unique. They're kind of pendulous. They come off at an angle of this, um, and I absolutely love it. So definitely an old-fashioned plant, but one that has done very well on my very shaded part of the garden. And once established, I have never watered it. It just loves the moisture it gets from the winters primarily. The next plant is coral bells. Um, I have a collection of coral bells as well. So I tend to collect things like the sedums and the coral bells. Uh, these are plants that really prefer full shade or at least partial shade. Um, they can be very drought tolerant so they can take dry shade. So if you're looking for plants that um, where you have a really tough spot that's shaded, this would be a good selection. Um, and I love this because of the diversity in the foliage. The flowers are nice, they attract pollinators. Um, they dance atop the, uh, the plants themselves, which are more mounded, but the 
foliage is so interesting. So we have variegated forms, we have different colors. We have some like in the top right that are very dark chocolate colored, but then we have some that are more lime green. And so you can provide a lot of contrast in the garden. Um, they are rabbit and deer resistant. They're fairly easy to grow. And again, you will fall in love with the names. There's cherry cordial, there's chocolate ruffles. Um, they just sound good. They're just good to eat plants. They sound delicious. So don't eat them, but you know, they, they're fun. Uh, and then the next one I have is uh, Brunnera or Bugloss, however you want to say it. I just call it Brunnera. And Brunnera is kind of a, a typical shade plant. Um, if you grew up in the Midwest or you're from the Midwest, you know that Brunnera can kind of be a brute. It can get out of control, especially if it gets too much water. And this is something that I would caution you on. So make sure that you are respecting the water needs of the plants. Um, if the plants aren't growing or you're not having good success or you're getting disease pressure, it could come down to irrigation levels. So Brunnera is one that again is going to do well in full to part shade, uh, fairly drought resistant. Um, they don't mind occasional moisture, but really dial it down. Like, very, be very cautious because it can get out of control. Uh, there was one that was a plant, um, a CSU plant trials best of, and that's the one on the right, the alchemy silver. You can see the regular Brunnera on the left is green with really cool periwinkle flowers. And then this was an introduction where it had more of silver foliage and still with those periwinkle flowers. So again, it really brightens up a nice shaded spot in the landscape. I think this is me. Okay, so next up for our shade lovers is anemone. Uh, anemones are incredibly variable in their color. They can bloom in spring, summer, or fall. You can get white, white to pink flowers, and the plants can be very petite. They can be as small as six inches. Um, they can get up to 36 inches. They can tolerate moderate moisture, but they don't mind a little bit of extra. So if you have that spot in your yard that ends up being a moisture sink these can can be a really good one and they do give just such a pop of color in those shady areas that sometimes it's a little bit hard to find hellebores i love a hellebore and it's one that we just you don't see in a lot of landscapes and i'm not quite sure why because once they're established they are very very tough they can tolerate extra moisture, but they can also tolerate being quite dry. Um, they get to be about two feet by two feet, and they are another one of those that will um, bloom fairly early in the season. So they can be a nice uh, option for pollinators early in the season in, um, in springtime. Uh, once they are established, like I said, they're very tolerant of drought. They are to very tolerant of cold. The main time that they don't like to dry out is late in the summer when we're hot and dry. They do need to have a little bit of supplemental moisture at, at that point. Um, we lost ours in our demonstration garden at that point because we, there was an irrigation issue. Um, they do, some, some of them do reseed fairly readily, but they're not going to become a major problem. You can transplant those baby seedlings somewhere else or you can pull them, rogue them out and, and move on from there. I think I had one other, the winter bells, just look at that lovely, they're, they're kind of like an antique color, like they kind of have antique colors. Some of them can be almost a chartreuse and, and green, they can be white, they can be more of a purple, there's a lot of different varieties in those winter bells. They are introduced ornamentals, but they are a lovely choice for shade if you've got a space where you want to fill them. Next up are the northern sea oats. This is another ornamental grass. This is one of the few ornamental grasses that will tolerate and grow fairly well in shade. It is a beautiful, has a beautiful seed head that will persist into winter. I mean, just look at that. It looks like a little sheath of, of wheat or something like that, um, or oats, I suppose, hence the name. Um, it is native to the Midwest, so not far off from us, but a little bit. It can get up to four feet tall, so maybe good as a backdrop to an ornamental bed. It is deer resistant, and it's good as a host plant for butterflies in their larval stage, so as caterpillars. That's one aspect of planting pollinator gardens that people don't always consider 
Um, if you are interested in attracting pollinators, you need to have plants that the, the larva, the caterpillar can, can eat and rest and live their lives on as well. Northern sea oats, as a, with a lot of our shade plants, can also tolerate wetter areas fairly well. Um, oh, somebody just said that they that northern sea oats has become a bit invasive in their garden. So maybe make make sure you've got it in a space where if a little bit of spreading is okay, or if you um, make sure you stay on top of it if you see some babies coming up. But or reduce your watering is often a good way to take care of some of that. Um, that's spreading. I, I'm sorry to hear that it's become invasive. It's one of, I know it's one of the favorites amongst a lot of horticulturists in our area. Bellflower or Campanula is another good one. We have both native and ornamental varieties. Uh, they, uh, some of the ornamental ones um, look like a little puffed up balloon and then they pop open into a flower. So it's uh, it's really, really lovely. Um, they do have a range of different colors, light to dark blue. I've seen some that are on more on the white spectrum. Uh, they tend to be very small to very tall, so there's a lot of different var variation in in what you're getting in what you what you can select on bellflowers um, in terms of size. And the main thing to know is if you're looking for something like a bellflower, don't. Um, seek out the creeping bellflower, which can become wildly invasive and very hard to get to eradicate. Um, so make sure that you're finding bellflowers that are not Campanula uh, rapunculoides. Okay, columbine. Was that you, Al? Nope, that's you. Okay, that's still me. Okay, columbine. Yay. Um, another one of my favorite flowers. I know I'm just, I mean, this whole talk is us talking favorites. So, <laughs> um, there uh, is a variety of columbine that is native here in Colorado, but there are also many different, uh, cultivars that you can grow very happily throughout the state. You can get a, you can just have a whole range of color. They, they come in almost every single color you can think of. There are whites, there are reds. There are yellows, there are the blue, the, the typical Colorado columbine blue. They're attractive for a lot of our pollinators. Um, they do grow both in sun and in shade. They can be drought resistant, although they, let, although they do like a little bit of moisture. Um, they will self-seed. And if you have a hybrid variety, you're not always guaranteed that they're going to self-seed in the same color that you had. That certainly happened to me. I um, rescued a handful of columbine from a big box store uh, with permission from from the the nursery the manager of the store uh, and in subsequent years they all reseeded and now I have like 500 white columbine plants and I think the originals were purple so they will see self seed but they're pretty easy to rogue out if they're in an area that you don't like you can, if they're in an area that's a little too shady or a little too, like, not quite right for them, you can see a lot of aphid or leaf miner damage on them, but it's not going to impact the overall health of the plant. If it bothers you, you can keep, um, clip that particular flower off and, and keep going with the remainder of them. Here's a couple examples. Denver Gold, this one in our demonstration garden, tends to self-seed fairly readily, but it can be roped back pretty easily. If you're as long as you stay on top of it, remembrance such a beautiful blue and white kind of that typical Colorado columbine color, but just with a little bit more intensity. Okay, and then bugle. All right, bugle weed. So don't think I'm crazy because bugle weed, if you grew it again in a place with a lot more moisture, super invasive, but not here. So again, if you're monitoring moisture levels, a lot of these plants should behave themselves. The reason I added bugle weed is just because it has such fun foliage. It's a great ground cover and there's a lot of diversity. Um, only gets to be about six inches tall, has cute little flowers, um, but can spread because it grows via stolons. And so again, watch the water on this one. A couple of varieties of bugle weed to consider. I think I have those in here. Hopefully, the next slide. Um, chocolate chip. Can, I love these names. I'm like such a sucker for names. Uh, chocolate chip, which is, has some more of those darker burgundy colors with some of that lighter green. And then burgundy glow, which kind of 
looks like it has powdery mildew, um, but it is nice. It's more of a diminutive color, kind of would go with the hellebores that you might have in your garden. So that could be a great choice. Um, and then the last plant is an ornamental grass that does well in shade and can do well in um, dry shade as well are the dwarf blue fescues. Now there's a whole bunch of cultivars that you could consider. Um, Elijah blue, that's the one featured in the photos, um, probably the most common. And they're just these little cute mounds of blue. I love them, they're great. There's one called sea urchin, so cute. Um, but they're really, really small and they're a very, very blue color. So um, a wonderful addition again to brighten up to kind of a, a, a dry, shady spot. Um, rabbits do like them. I will give you that uh, little tip. They can die out in the center, uh, but what's really nice, they don't need pruning in the spring. And so really just let them go. Um, you could give them a small haircut, uh, but for the most part, they don't need any pruning at all. We will end here uh, with our last slide. Cassie and I both have our contact information there. If we didn't cover something or you need clarification, please send us an email. Um, this summer and spring when you're at the garden centers, make sure you know where you're going to put your plants before you buy them because that's a problem we all have. Um, and as a reminder, this webinar was recorded Please join us in March, March 13th at noon. I just put it in the chat. You can register to hear a little bit more about some of our WaterWise updates statewide. Cassie, any final comments? Well, thank you so much for joining. And hopefully there was at least one or two plants that you're going to go seek out and find that possible place in your landscape to put them in. If so, let us know. True. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.